Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the first ever Online Science Faculty Research Day 2020. I'm the MC of today's event, Angela. Let's welcome the moderator of today's webinar, Professor Li Wenjiang, the Science Faculty Associate Dean for Research. Professor Jiang, please. All right. Can you hear me all right, everyone? Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Li Wenjiang from the School of Life Sciences. Uh, Faculty of Science, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So on behalf of the Faculty of Science, I would like to welcome you all to the Science Faculty Research Day 2020. So this year's theme is on the collaborative research in the Faculty of Science and beyond, okay? So to kickstart this uh, research day, may I first invite our new Dean of Science, uh, Professor Song Chen San for delivering an open remark. Professor Song, please. Thank you, Li Wen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome all of you to the first research day online, the virtual research day from the Faculty of Science at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, this is a, a very interesting event. Um, it's also our experiment to continue moving forward with our research day showcase of our faculty research expertise um, in the uh, climate of this uh, pandemic. And, and we're not giving in, we're continuing to move forward. But in the meantime, to be conscious of the uh, public health and the safety and the safety of our faculty and students, we are moving to online. Um, and we'll continue to, fall, uh, continue to facilitate the research in advance and continue with the discussion and exchange of ideas to facilitate the collaboration. Uh, for those of you who have, I have not met, uh, I'm Chen Shan Song. I just joined the faculty as the new dean. Um, personally, I'm very pleased to be able to address you from inside of Hong Kong. Um, coming here has been a challenge because my flight has been canceled several times. Um, in the past several months, including my most recent trip to here. Uh, but I'm finally able to be able uh, to join you and actually physically addressing you by sitting inside the CUHK campus. So um, from now on, I'll be with you, physically with you, and also virtually with you. And, and hopefully, we will be able to move forward our science to the next higher level, uh, both in terms of independent research and in the collaborative research. In my learning process, I've been impressed by the research accomplishment of the faculty members and students um, with the help of our uh, staff in the science faculty. We have made a major accomplishment, both in the sense of faculty achievement in terms of award, fellowship from major foundation, award from professional societies, and major research grant, including collaborative research grant, and also the area of research grant. Um, I think uh, based on my account, we have received a 13 uh, collaborative research grant and also a three area of excellent award. So these are uh, important signs of a success. And obviously by virtue of science, we never stop at what we have achieved. Our intellectual curiosity will drive us forward and our um, aquarium mind will continue to push us to ask a why and why not and what if type of questions uh, to push us forward. But in the meantime, in the um, social engagement in the, uh, to address global challenges, the science faculty continue to move forward in the area of, of our excellence, <clears throat> not only in the traditional discipline of excellence in the science faculty, but also we're reaching out and to promote a further collaboration between faculty members in different disciplines. In that sense, and, and that collaboration not limited to just the faculty of science, we very well reach outside the science faculty to other faculties and even to outside the CHK, both in the research and education. In many ways, our graduate education is closely linked to research our undergraduate education is also promoted by research. Um, our excellent faculty members and both our senior faculty members, our junior faculty members are moving forward with research 
in many frontiers, as that we're, we're going to hear today. We have uh, six distinguished speakers today. Uh, we will be listening to the recent advanced research and in collaborative work. Hopefully, um, this event will catalyze a discussion among the faculty members in learning what the others do, in what it could promote in the area that we haven't thought about, in the sense of the spark of the thought, where we may generate new ideas for further collaborative research, as well as the independent research to go forward. So um, my office is in the uh, T36 in the Science North Center building. Um, I look forward to hearing the research today from our distinguished speaker today and learning I'll be with the uh, meeting for the whole session this morning. And I will be learning and listening. And also I welcome the faculty members to reach out and, and we can meet more in person. And so I can learn more of what you do um, and learn something about uh, the details of your research firsthand. And, and also what we can do from the science faculty, our dinner team, our unit head in the department and in the school and also in the program, so what we can do to help promote the research and promote the collaboration. So I look forward to an interesting session this morning and I want to thank all of our team, um, Professor Li Wenjiang and, and uh, Angela Hong and Jackie Yao and all, all of our staff members who helped to organize this event. More importantly, I'd like to thank our speakers, our six distinguished speakers today and who are um, going to share with us what they have done and they have recently accomplished. And also I'd like to thank all of you for your participation. Um, I hope that this will kickstart a new series of discussion and that will help to promote our science and our collaboration. With that, I wish you all a exciting and uh, entertaining morning of a science day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Song. Okay. So before we move on to the first speaker, I would like to mention a few housekeeper, housekeeping items. First, look at this. Uh, we, have, we do have very beautiful PDF uh, booklet, okay, which has been uploaded into the chat room. Okay, you can find it from the chat room. Okay, and also from the program, you, you may notice that there are six speakers. Okay, for today's uh, symposium, each speaker we we only have uh, 50 minutes for talk followed by five minutes uh, Q&A section, okay? So at the 30 minutes, Angela we will give you a reminder, okay? Maybe two minutes before the time's up, okay? And also during the talk, or at the end of the talk, the audience, you can uh, send in your, 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 your question through the chat room, okay? And Angela will read the question on your behalf to, to ask the question to the speakers, okay? So, and I think that that's some of the arrangement we will have, okay? The question will be asked based on the first come, first service, okay? All right, so without further delay, may I first invite the uh, Xin Yuan to introduce the first speakers. Professor Song? Yeah, yeah, okay. So good morning, I'm Xin Yuan Song from the Department of Statistics. I'm pleased to introduce today's first speaker, Professor Wei Yingying. Professor Wei is an associate professor in the Department of Statistics. She obtained her bachelor's degree in mathematics from Tsinghua University in 2009, and her master's degree in computer science and a PhD degree in biostatistics from the Joe Hopkins University in 2014. Her research focused on developing statistical methods for analyzing noisy, complex, and uh, heterogeneous figure genomic data. Professor Wei received the Faculty Teaching Award in 2017 and the W.J. Yudin Award in Interlaboratory Testing from the American Statistical Association in 2019. Moreover, Professor Wei has been awarded a GRF grants in the past five consecutive years. Her six bioconductor R packages have been well received by the community 
with almost 60,000 standards so far. Today, she will present a talk, Statistical Genomics from Bug Tissue to Single Cell. Let's welcome Professor Wei. Thanks, Professor Song. So can you see my slides? Yes. OK, thanks, Al. So first, I want to thank the faculty for this precious opportunity and Professor Song for the kind introduction. Today, I will talk about statistical genomics from bulk tissue to single cell. I will first introduce some work we have done in the past and discuss some potential directions that maybe we can work together with colleagues from Faculty of Science towards a CIS. Thanks to high throughput technologies, nowadays we can measure tens of thousands or even millions of genomic features for an individual. So at the end of the day of a high throughput experiment, we can obtain a matrix like this one, where each row corresponds to a genomic feature that can be either gene expression values, DNA methylation levels, SNP, or copy number. And each column corresponds to an individual. So usually we take a piece of tissue or blood samples from patients. It is not forcing, uh, it's no, uh, so we can note actually the tissue consists of many cells. What we are actually measuring is the average genomic profiles, for example, the average gene expression levels among all these cells. And with a matrix like this, we actually can do many things in statistics. We can do association detection to identify those genomic features that is associated with phenotypes, for example, disease status. We can build models to predict whether the patient, whether the individual is a patient or a healthy individual. When the sample label is unknown, we can also do clustering. So today I will talk about association detection and clustering for bulk data. So why we care so much about clustering? Because at the end of the day, we all hope we can develop individualized treatment. However, in practice, the best we can hope for is subgroup analysis. So how can we use high throughput genomic data to define patient's subtypes and find the optimum treatment for each subtype. Here we have some gene expression, real gene expression data collected from our breast cancer patients. Each row corresponds to a gene and each column corresponds to an individual. So may I ask a question? So how many groups are there? So hopefully most people agree there are three groups, right? Um, but if we look into the details uh, of the data set, Unfortunately, they don't correspond to three subtypes. They actually correspond to three data sets. There are three batch of data we collected from three batch of patients, okay? So therefore, if we directly pull data across different batches and do the clustering, we'll cluster samples according to batches, rather according to disease subtypes. So the problem is now, how can we tease out the biological variability from the technical artifacts? when the sample labels are unknown, because the technical artifacts can completely overwhelm the biological variability. Another issue is the computational complexity. Uh, a naive approach is that we can try to do clustering within each data set, within each batch, then we can try to match the clusters across different batches. However, the computational complexity of those approaches will grow exponentially in the number of batches B, and factorial in the number of subtypes K. Another important question is, when can we combine different batches? Can we always combine any two data sets jointly for clustering? Unfortunately, the answer is no. So here we use different color to represent different subtypes. Suppose on batch one, we measure subtype one and subtype two, while on batch two, we measure subtypes three and subtype four. So then no method can ever be invented to distinguish the technical artifacts from the biological variability between these two batches. So in our paper, we actually prove that in addition to the complete setting where each batch measures all of the subtypes. So under more flexible scenarios like the reference panel and chain type scenarios, we can also separate the technical artifacts from the biological variability and do joint clustering. So in the reference panel, so we assume there exists a huge hospital which collects patients from all of the subtypes. So then for the other hospitals, as long as they collect patients from at least two subtypes, so then we will be fine. So then people can say that can also be too demanding. How can I guarantee there exists such a, a super hospital? So then no worry. So we actually can show, suppose two nearby batches, they share at least two subtypes. 
For example, on batch one and batch two, they share the green and the blue subtypes, while on batch two and batch three, they share the blue and the purple subtypes, then we'll also be fine. So more generally, so if we represent each batch as a node in a graph and connect two batches, suppose they share at least two subtypes. As long as the graph is a connected one, then we can separate the technical artifacts from the biological variability, even though we don't know the sample clusters for each individual. So here you may wonder why I emphasize so much on, two, on the sharing of two subtypes. Why sharing of one subtype cannot work? So I will not go to the proofs, but may, um, maybe I can use an analogy uh, to illustrate the idea behind. So suppose we observe two species in Russia, uh, a snow rabbit and a zebra tiger. So then we go to India. Suppose we observe only one animal. So then we can be very confused. Right? So whether this is a rabbit or it's a tiger or something else in India. Right? Um, but if we observe two species uh, in India, and we can see, it's, although we don't know what these two species are, but the contrast between these two species allow us to distinguish that one is rabbit and another is tiger. So then we can figure out the technical artifacts, the background noise. Then we can allow for a bear in Russia and a monkey in India. So for those data sets uh, that we can combine together for joint clustering, so we actually uh, develop statistical methods that reduce the computational complexity with modern factorial order complexity to linear order. So now let me move on to the association detection. As I mentioned in both experiments, what we measure is the average gene expression levels among all those cells. And recently people become aware. So the cellular composition can actually confound the association detection. For example, we can expect when a person is sick, the proportion of white blood cells will increase. So um, this can actually induce many false positives if we ignore the cellular composition. Let me use a toy example to illustrate the idea. So here we assume there's no measurement error. So if you see a difference, that is a difference. So we assume there are two cell types, the white blood cells and the T cells. In the normal samples, the white, cell, uh, white blood cells take up 60%, while in the patients, 90% of the cells are the white blood cells. The underlying truth is that only the fourth genomic feature is associated with disease status in the white blood cell, but not in the T cell. But however, we can only observe the brown numbers, the average level at the aggregate level. So if we directly compare the aggregate level brown numbers, so we, can, we will wrongly claim actually all these four genomic features are associated uh, with the disease status. So we develop a method that is called HIGH, stands for high resolution. So your input will steal the aggregate level data from the bulk experiments. We can not only deconvolute the cellular composition for each individual person, but we are able to claim the association between the genomic features and the phenotypes for each individual cell type for the first time for DNA methylation data. So, so far I have talked about the association detection and clustering for the bulk experiments. So um, fortunately, uh, in the past several years, now we not only can deconvolute uh, the cell type specific association from the bulk data, we can actually measure the genomic profile of each individual cell with a single cell experiment. So now given a, a piece of tissue, we can dissociate the cells into individual cells and then try to measure the genomic feature of each individual cell. And the major problem in statistical genomics in the past two to three years is how can we do the cell clustering and identify the new cell types for the single cell um, data. So the data structure is actually very similar as before. But now for each person, for each patient, we can obtain a matrix like this. And now each column corresponds to a cell instead of an individual. Now the problem becomes how can we do the joint clustering across different patients? So the same challenges uh, exist as before, especially experimental design, because now we cannot expect each patient to contain all of the cell types. Right? For example, the healthy individuals will not contain cancer cells. But on top of that, as the genomic material within each individual cell is much lower than the material 
when we collect from a bulk samples. So the data becomes much more noisy. And we have something called dropout events, which means um, even if a gene is actually expressed in our data, maybe we'll observe zero counts. So that's something called missing, not at random. So you can expect, for example, when we do a survey for people's income, the, lowly, uh, the low income class may have higher than response rate. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we can build upon on our previous uh, framework and tackle all these challenges. So we develop uh, statistical methods that actually achieves higher accuracy than the competing methods, including those use deep learning methods. So it sounds uh, great, um, but what will be the challenge? So the challenge will be, I, in principle, now we can do single cell experiments for all the patients. However, in practice, it's unrealistic to do all the thing for, to, for each patient to conduct a single cell experiment. So in this uh, proposal, I hope that we can develop statistical methods to integrate the bulk data and the single cell data to leverage the advantage of both data types. As we have seen before, right, integration of bulk data by itself can be challenging, and integration of single cell data by itself can be challenging. But there are opportunities here. So for the single cell data, not only, as I mentioned, it may be expensive to assay all the patients, Moreover, because of the experimental uh, protocols, when we dissociate the tissue into single cells, we may kill some cells. So the cellular composition obtained by the single cell experiments may not reflect the underlying true cell abundance. And moreover, the protocol may also alternate the expression levels of certain genes. So the bulk data still have its advantage. And it can be very cheap to use the bulk data to assay hundreds or even thousands of patients. So if we can develop statistical methods that can integrate uh, these two data types, so then we can conduct cheap bulk example for hundreds or even thousands of patients. While meanwhile, for several individual patients, we can do single cell experiments to understand uh, the detailed cell level uh, heterogeneity of those patients. And by integrating these two data types, we will have a better understanding of the system. And this can open doors to many very interesting problems. So one field uh, that is very hot now is the spatial genomics. So the idea is that uh, given a tissue sample from the patient, so at one hand, uh, we can uh, take some cells to conduct single cell experiments. But on the other hand, for this tissue, so we can take all those spots, for each of those spots, we do a bulk experiment. Then the idea is that actually we can link these two data types and try to map those single cells back to the tissue. Then we can see how those individual cells are aligned on the tissue. So then we can understand the microenvironment, for example, how the cancer cells exist in the tissue. So I think this is a very exciting field. There and is another, two minutes left. Okay, thanks a lot. So another field uh, that is very interesting is about how do the multi-omics for single cell data. So in the past, uh, how we measure the multi-omics for single cell data is given a group of uh, cells, then we randomly uh, select some cells and send them to measure their gene expression. Then we randomly sample another group of cells and then send them for, uh, for example, a taxi. Then we can develop methods to try to link uh, these two data types. So in our department, Professor Zhi Xiangling actually mainly work on that problem. But recently, with the advance of technologies, now we can simultaneously measure multi-modalities within each individual cell. So as far as I know, um, Professor Angela Wu at Hong Kong USC is uh, planning and leading a CRF proposal to develop single cell technologies that can measure more than two modalities. With a, within a single cell. So I think if we can couple uh, these multi-omics um, methods with the bulk data, so we can uh, investigate the multi-omics in a spatial genomics. So um, therefore, in this proposal, I wish that we can develop statistical methods uh, to integrate both single cell data and uh, the bulk data with both spatial uh, and multi-omics perspectives. So then to answer the question, why a CRF instead of a GRF? So we definitely need help from our colleagues uh, at Spectre of Science. So we need colleagues 
uh, to help us to identify an ideal biological system to conduct experiments and um, also uh, collect the data. So we actually ha already have some collaborations within our faculty of science. So three years ago, one of the two faculty major research area projects uh, is the system information science. So Professor Ting Gong Chen, Professor Emily Ching, Professor Xiao Dan Fan, Professor Jerome Hui, and myself are involved in this project. And Ting Fong and Jerome have actually already collected some single cell data uh, for Drosophila. So this year, Jerome has also uh, submitted a CRF proposal, and it has already been shortlisted. I'm also involved uh, in the project. And moreover, in our faculty, uh, we also have other single cell experts. As I mentioned, Zhi Jiang in our department works a lot on single cell multiomics, and uh, Yilin is for sure the world leading expert on chemical and physical interaction of single cells in multicellular development process. So I think we have an edge here, um, and hopefully we can develop some projects together uh, to understand the microenvironment of single cells better. Okay, so I think that's all I have. All right. Thank you, Professor Wei. Um, yeah, uh, we've got a question from the audience. Actually, uh, it's from Professor Jiang. Um, he would like to know, um, can you generate your own cell, single cell data for analysis? And are you interested in plant cells research? Uh, yeah, for sure. I'm very interested in plant cell uh, research. Uh, so unfortunately, I'm a statistician, so I got my training all in mathematics, like computer science, and statistics, but I cannot do wet lab uh, experiments. So that's why uh, I'm very eager to collaborate with colleagues from uh, School of Life Sciences and other departments uh, to collect data and investigate the systems. Yeah. Uh, so does that answer the question? I think we can discuss more offline about plant uh, cell research. Yeah. I'm very interested in that. All right, thank you for this way. Um, is there some question from a panelist? If so, um, uh, you can put up your hands in the screen and then let us know. All right, if no, um, thank you, Professor Wei, again. And then uh, we shall proceed to our next speaker. Um, may I now invite <laughs> Professor Wong to introduce our next speaker, Professor Jerome Hoy, please. Professor yeah, sure. Wong, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, it's actually my honor to uh, introduce uh, my colleagues, uh, Jerome, Professor Jerome Hoy, to, to this, uh, uh, on this uh, research day. Uh, Jerome Hoy, Andrew, um, he, after he graduated in Hong Kong University for his uh, undergraduate, he moved to um, uh, get his uh, PhD in uh, the University of Oxford under the supervision of uh, Professor Peter Holland, uh, who is an expert in uh, using um, you know, modern genomic molecular bi biology techniques to study biodiversity. And then um, after he, um, he joined um, the um, School of Life Science, um, he's actually very um, active and very productive in terms of uh, getting grants, various of grants and um, papers. And um, he's actually um, also a recipient of actually two times of uh, um, faculty assembly teaching award in uh, 2014 and uh, 2018. And um, his uh, research interests, uh, probably you'll hear about him um, or his talk uh, sometime later, is uh, using a multidisciplinary approach, in particular genomics um, and bioinformatics to understand um, uh, biodiversity, how a living organism responds to environment, in particular, uh, um, probably he's going to talk about um, in response to climate change. And uh, with, uh, without further ado, um, I would uh, actually uh, present uh, Professor Jerome Ho to you. And Jerome, it's your time. Uh, thank you, Professor Wong. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so uh, I, I hope you'll be able to see everything well. Uh, so good morning, everyone. I mean, uh, thank you, Professor Wong, for the uh, kind introduction. And thank you for the faculty for giving the opportunity to share the work 
that we have been doing at the uh, School of Life Sciences with you. So today I'm going to pick a topic that we have been working on, which is a mo animal model on jellyfish. So uh, we, I, I'll go through it when, when I keep on saying. So the story starts here. So in late 2012, when I was a young PI starting from here, so uh, you always want to start a new animal model. I mean, that is different from your supervisor. So you can really become independent. So uh, I, over the past eight years, I've been setting up uh, numerous animal models. I mean, so my work mainly focuses on three aspects, but they're all relating to animal biology and evolution from genomics, hormones, and small RNAs. So when the, when the faculty asked us to come up with a CRF proposal that we can uh, come up with colleagues within the, within the Faculty of Science together with, uh, with uh, maybe colleagues inside the university. So it has been really, really hard for me to think of a model. And then eventually I choose jellyfish. Why jellyfish, okay? So, well, I, I have to spend a little bit of time on this slide in order to introduce you why jellyfish is important from many different aspects, no matter from bioluminance, I mean, that people already obtain the GFP for the Nobel Prize. What, what is relating to today's talk will be the jellyfish bloom in the environment. So when jellyfish are actually growing very massively, I mean, all of a sudden in the environment, they, they will call, I mean, a lot of uh, swimmers to go staying but they will also clog the industry because of the coolant system. They will clog the industry and also the power station, for example, which is an, a real environmental problem over there. Of course, I mean, from, from staining and venom to which uh, they have the nematocysts, I mean, so they have the venom. If some people, when they were being stung by jellyfish, they will actually die. In Asia, I mean, in many of our cuisines, I mean, we have, we use it as food, I mean, so, I mean, my collaborators in Europe and US always find fascinating that we eat them. But that is actually very interesting. Not all jellyfish can be eaten because some are toxic. The one in China, for example, I mean, they have been kept in the industry. We can fish them, we can, we can eat them. Why? Origin of muscle, like ourselves, like human, we have three germ layers, like skin, muscle, and gut. But these animals only have two. So they only have the outside layer, and also the gut. The middle one are just the, what we call mesoglea, just water. So how do they come up? And what is very interesting also relating to uh, biomedical, if people would like, is regeneration. If you cut my hand, my skin will only proliferate back, but not the whole hand will come out. But if you cut jellyfish, the whole jellyfish will regenerate. And also there's some what we call immortality. Jellyfish, I mean, what we see jellyfish, I mean, they're swimming like this, they are at the adult stage. When you look at the juvenile stage, they are very, very different. There's one jellyfish to which people will see from juvenile stage to adult, and the adult back into juvenile. So that's why they call immortal, they never die. And recently people discovered that that is actually linked with the mechanism of regeneration that they have. So recently, of course, I mean, my group has uh, published a jellyfish genomes paper, and we are very fortunate that the journal has chosen uh, our article and also the image as the feature image. So if you go to the website now, you will see our feature image on the journal. So I must tell you and share with you some of the findings that we have found in this study before I propose what is the proposal. I must go through what we have found out first. So in this paper, what we have been doing is we have sequenced two genomes of two jellyfish and three RNAs, I mean, small RNAs of three jellies. Don't worry about those names. Focus on the biology first. Take a look into the two jellyfish, the three jellyfish. The one on the left-hand side is what we call edible jellyfish, okay? So that is something that we eat, okay? Non-toxic one usually distributed in Asia. The one in the middle is actually the one that is uh, distributed in East Asia from Hong Kong, mainland China to, I mean, uh, Korea and Japan. And the other one on the right hand side is called moon jelly. That is distributed around the whole world. I mean, Asia, North America, Europe, Atlantic Pacific and Indian Ocean. So we have three models that actually distribute very differently in different places around the globe. 
In that study, we have found several unexpected findings. I can't go through all of them due to the limited amount of time. So I, can only, I will focus on two aspects that will be relating to the talk about the jellyfish bloom that I want to propose later. And the two major things are hormones and small RNAs. Hormones, I mean, there are numerous hormones, I mean, all the animals. I want to talk about sesquiterpenoids. What are they, okay? Uh, I understand people are coming from very, very diverse backgrounds. So I will use a, a better term, which is called juvenile hormones. That will be easier to understand in insects. So in the diagram over here, you show, it's showing you two types of insects. The one in the upper level is what we call hemimetabolans. Don't worry about the name. That is direct development. For example, grasshopper or cockroaches, once they are born like a a cricket or, or cockroach or, or grasshopper, throughout life, they're like that, just like a human, this direct development. But we know some insects, they will go through metamorphosis. For example, they will come from egg, larvae, pupae, adult. This is called metamorphosis in butterflies, for example. How do they actually happen in this kind of biology are all controlled by the hormones, sesquiterpenoids or juvenile hormones, to which the hormones always need to be very, very high level when they're juveniles, and then suddenly they drop the level, then they can go into metamorphosis, okay? Humans do not have juvenile hormone, unfortunately, okay? So uh, in, in us, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, it actually comes from excitate uh, melanoid pathway, and then in us, it will be converted into cholesterol, okay? So we don't have the enzymes. So it has been long thought, people, have found juvenile hormones back into the 50s and 60s, in the, in the last century, is something unique in insects. Yeah, in recent years, we think maybe they're also in arthropods. And when we have our first, gen when our first two jellyfish genomes, we found that, ah, they are actually in jellyfish. That is a, a really, really big surprise that people think something that is only in insects are now in jellyfish. What are their functions? What are their roles? Could they be involved in growth and regulation? This is the first hint of the proposal that I want to tell you. So this is, we found a hormone that is not supposed to be in jellyfish, it's now in jellyfish. The other thing I want to talk about is small RNAs. Again, I know people are coming from very diverse background, so I'm not going to bore you with all the mechanism. I will tell you only one major aspect. So, this kind of small RNA, so DNA trans, transcribed into RNA, RNA translated into protein. So some RNA will not translate into protein, but they're actually functional. We call non-coding RNA. This kind of non-coding RNA, if they are very short in size, we call small RNAs. In human, let's use human as an example. There are two major types of small RNAs, including microRNAs and PVRNAs. MicroRNAs usually in cell, they regulate gene expression. And PVRNAs usually in, uh, in germ cells to which they regulate transports on activities to avoid when the cells are developing, they will get mutated easily, okay? So microRNAs in somatic cells, PVRNAs in germ cells. So very, very different, two types of, micro, uh, two types of small RNAs. And you know, jellyfish, I mean, if you take a look into panel B, Red represents the microRNAs. Green represents the PVRNA. We found that in the gonad, you have both, but actually in all the somatic cells, you also have both. So we are saying something like, you have both the microRNA and PVRNA in somatic cells in jellyfish. How do they actually regulate biological mechanism together? This is something unknown as well. So a quick summary of the finding at the hypothesis that I put up for the proposal is that insect juvenile or sesquiterpenoid hormones are now found in jellyfish. So there's some unknown hormones or unknown functions. I mean, I'm thinking about a hypothesis like this because as I've said, what we see in the jellyfish is uh, at the adult stage, is the medusa stage, is the one that you always see they are swimming around. But at the early stage, they are polyp and this kind of metamorphosis perhaps could be controlled by this kind of newly described and newly discovered hormones. 
and perhaps also small RNAs that both find in the somatic cells could be involved. If I want to tackle this question, this is a GRF, I can do it maybe with a few colleagues, but we want to make, put it a bigger scope and a bigger question. So we need colleagues that we want to answer this question, which is global jellyfish bloom. Jellyfish with unknown reasons, there are many beautiful hypotheses. People have been uh, uh, linking to climate change, nutrients or temperature or physical parameters, or basically just the biology of the, of the animals. There's no answers yet, okay? So, but if the only, only thing we know well is that it really impacts the ecological food web, cycling of nutrients, fishing industry, power station, tourism, et cetera. Big problem, but the causes and the effects are still unknown. So of course, as a biologist myself in the School of Life Science, I can tackle biology, genomics, et cetera, but we need a bigger team in order to tackle this big question globally. So with that, I point out three major directions in order to solve this question. We need to understand the biological and environmental causes of jellyfish bloom. We need to understand the environmental effects on jellyfish biology. And we also want to understand jellyfish bloom effect on the environment. How can we do that? To do that, I mean, of course, I mean, I have asked, I mean, I've been trying to bug my friends and say, oh, come, 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 okay. But so, I mean, I myself, I can tackle on jellyfish uh, biology, hormones, genome, and small RNA. My friend uh, TF, I mean, in also a school of life science, will be tackling the long encoding RNA. Uh, my friend uh, Amos from the Earth Science, System Science, will be trying to do some modeling. I mean, how, seeing how jellyfish in the environment would do the bloom under the different physical parameters. Ying Ying, who has just given a, uh, given a talk, I mean, we'll be working on single cell transcriptomics and see how they are relating into regulation for the biology. And also Kevin from computer science, we'll be working on epigenetics, basically. But I think, I mean, this problem is too big. We cannot handle by ourselves. So we need more people. I mean, can we get more people from the faculty of science? Maybe you, okay? So I think that's all for my talk. I mean, uh, uh, again, I thank the faculty for giving us the opportunity to talk and share with you some of the ideas that we've been thinking. And uh, we come from the School of Life Science. And if you have any questions, comments, or you wish to be have uh, collaborations, I mean, you're very welcome. Okay, thank you. I think I'm good on time. Okay. Very good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Hoy. Uh, we've got some questions from the panelists. Uh, so uh, it's quite a lot, so I read it one by one. Um, all right. The first one is that uh, is that jellyfish a good model for stem cell research? Or can you make transgenic jellyfish? All right. The second question is that um, are you interested? All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, actually, it's shown in the chat room. You may oh, just oh, refer okay. to it directly. All right. Uh, next question is that, um, oh, Jerome, are you interested in structural biology of jellyfish polyome? <laughs> yeah. And then um, the third question is, um, how easy to grow, maintain, and manipulate jellyfish? Oh. Okay. Okay. I, I'll answer one by one. I mean, the first question is about jellyfish model and mutant. Uh, Yes, we can keep jellyfish, I mean, uh, in lab. And also, I mean, we, we have been, well, our, our School of Life Science have an MOU with uh, the Ocean Park, so that uh, sometimes I steal the jellyfish from the Ocean Park, uh, Hong Kong Ocean Park. So we are fine with the, with the model. Can we make mutants? That is a very good question. So I've been discussing with people from the uh, Woods Holes. I mean, so the director of Woods Holes, uh, actually, uh, I know him. So. So uh, Nipal, uh, Patel, so Nipal is actually doing, trying to build on mutants, uh, not successful yet, but are trying to do. So uh, we, of course, here, we also try to do ourselves. Second question, are we interested in structural biology? Of course, I mean, uh, who asked the question? I mean, uh, I, I couldn't see, <laughs> but uh, uh, oh, oh, is that my boss? Okay, sorry. So uh, yes, of course. <laughs> so uh, anytime, uh, feel free. Uh, we are happy to talk anytime. Uh, sing, isolate single cell for transcriptome. Yeah, this is what we are thinking and are working with thinking on that. And also how easy uh, to, to manipulate. I think manipulating of physical parameters are very easy. 
I mean, it's just in the culture. And the question of the, uh, of the jellyfish itself, what we are now doing is we still need to complete the cycle very well. So uh, in addition to the three jellyfish I've shown you, actually we are developing new models in the lab. So I haven't shown you the talk, but uh, they're, go they're going okay. Yeah. So I hope I have answered all the questions so far. Uh, um, are there more? Yeah, there, there are still some questions, uh, okay. and we, I, got, I, we I, still got some time. So, okay, I, uh, okay, I, I just read out uh, another question. Are there any jellyfish jellyfish interactions as well, other than and farmer jellyfish interaction? Ah, good question. Uh, yes, we found when, when we go to the field. I mean, we found. I mean, so usually people know about anemone and anemone fish. So, at the anemone or the coral, I mean, they will protect some fish. I mean, inside. We, when we go to the field, we actually find this. Uh, some fish always swim very close to the jellyfish, okay? And those are, I, I, we, I don't want to talk about the species, we know what they are. So, and when we actually catch them uh, together, they will die. So that means when the big fish, if they need to big, grow big, when they are small, they will eat by other big fish, they will hide close to the jellyfish. Yeah, so there are some uh, jellyfish uh, interaction uh, other fish interaction. Right. So we got one uh, question from the uh, audience: Is the jellyfish the only known insect that has juvenile homo so far? Okay, so uh, uh, go back to our study. Uh, we have shown that not only jellyfish, actually the cnidarians, so corals, uh, sea anemones, they also have this type of hormones that we discovered for the first time. So for all this group of animals, so it has been very, very surprising. I think people miss, like, we haven't done the coral genome. Some people published the coral genome in science. They didn't look into that. We find this for the first time. So very, very surprising. So I hope I can answer your question. Uh, is there cell culture for jellyfish? It may be easier to gen generate mutants uh, in cell culture. Uh, unfortunately, no one has done that before, but uh, I think that could be a new collaboration. I mean, uh, with <laughs> Professor Shaw. <laughs> and uh, how come some jellyfish are tiny and some are a man of all size? A uh, good question. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, some <laughs> has been a big problem. Okay, I stop it. Okay, thank you. I, mean, I think there is one question from Professor Wong. Professor can, Wong I, can I still ask question? Of yeah, course, just for you. <laughs> okay, hi, right, Jerome. Uh, excellent talk, and I learned a lot. I think it's an exciting project. I'm very interested in, uh, but uh, some some basic science. Okay, if if you if you look at the jellyfish, probably it's a basic the radically uh, symmetry, right? Yes. Whereas insect is uh, bilateral. Yeah. Which means that these two species are actually diverged very very early on mm. in the evolution. In fact, I was actually very surprised, which is very exciting to hear that uh, the juvenile hormone, uh, uh, you know, probably the, you, you look at the uh, biosynthetic pathway, they're actually sort of uh, conserved in this early diverged, uh, uh, evoluted, you know, uh, divergent mm. species. Then the million dollar question is, uh, it says, has anyone to talk about uh, juvenile hormone receptors? How do they diverse in biosynthesis and receptor and how do they talk about the um, uh, signal transduction. I think there's a, a big, big door of discovery waiting for you and your team. Uh, uh, okay, uh, thank you, boss. I mean, uh, waiting for us, I mean, okay. So, uh, uh, very good question. In insects, I mean, different insects use different, slightly different juvenile hormone receptor. Jellyfish, because now we only discovered the uh, hormone the first time, I think the receptor is unknown. So uh, I, I think this is really, really good thought. You know, this is something biochemistry that I'm interested in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Professor Wong and Professor Hoy. Um, for those uh, unanswered questions, uh, would you mind sending the questions to the email of uh, the science faculty or uh, send to the speaker directly? Their emails can be found on the faculty web page. All right. Thank you, Professor Hoy. So, uh, shall we move to the next speaker? May I now invite Professor Chen to introduce our next speaker, Professor uh, Yang Huanfeng. Uh, Professor Chen, please. Uh, thank you. Um, so, good morning, everyone. So, I'm very pleased to here to give a brief introduction of my colleagues, uh, Professor Yang Huanfeng. 
So um, Professor Yang joined uh, CUHK with us in 2014, and he just uh, promoted to associate professor this uh, summer. Um, for his research, Professor Yang is uh, actively working on earthquake. Um, so in particular, he's interested in earthquake source physics, subduction zone dynamics, and also some fault zone structure and evolution. And of course, uh, today's talk about some uh, induced earthquake. Um, and also he has been actively serving in many professional organizations, including Chinese, Chinese uh, Geophysics Society, and also the Chinese uh, Seismological Societies. And also he has been served in many um, journals, scientific journals, and he's now is our associate editor for the Seismological Research Letters. And also for his uh, research achievement, so in 2018, Professor Yang received the Fu Chen Yi, uh, Yang Scientist Award from the Chinese Geophysical Society in the recognition of his contribution to integrate the earthquake's dynamics and observational seismology so that it can advance our understanding of the earthquake's physics and also the seismic hazard recognition. So we also want to highlight that uh, Professor Yang is the first recipient of this uh, prestigious award from Hong Kong. And also, um, Professor Yang has a very excellent uh, ground record and he's with a successful rate of 100%, so in the past uh, six years. And also um, for today, uh, he's going to give a talk about his work on the earthquakes induced by human and industrial activities. So uh, yes, please, uh, Hong Feng, yes, your time. Okay, okay, good morning. I'll start sharing my screen. Now, can you see my screen now? Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, thanks, uh, Manin, for the for a nice introduction. And it's really a great opportunity for me to share with you know, a diverse group of uh, scientists and students in faculty of science. And you know, as the, in terms of a scale matter and the first two speakers have basically increased from a single cell to jellyfish, but then I will boom the scale into at least you know, a few kilometers of scales talking about earthquakes. Uh, but then uh, I, I want to first, you know, to give, a, give you a impression that the earthquakes I'm talking about today is not very large earthquakes. And then, but then they are closely uh, associated with industrial activities, in particular, in particular in developing unconventional energy resources. This is actually an ongoing collaboration project between myself, among myself and my colleagues in Earth System Science and also from other external collaborators. And so why we care about this, and then I'll start with you know, the recognition in the past few decades that industrial activities can induce earthquakes. We use the term induce is because most of earthquakes are natural. So no matter what human you know, people are doing and then earthquake will occur, but there is a small class of earthquakes that are you know, caused by human activities. So we, we call it the induced earthquakes. And then in the past few decades, especially in the past two decades also, and then we found a lot of activities that are closely you know, associated with the energy. For example, we need different sort of energy and then we sometimes build up the water dams and then we also want to reduce the CO2 emission and then we do the CO2 uh, capture and sequestration. And then we need uh, different mining resources and then we need the geothermal resources. We also need the natural gas and we sometimes need the underground storage for the natural gas. So, um, all these activities may induce earthquakes, and then their common mechanism is there because they are doing fluid injection or extraction in the ground. And so another uh, you know, a major challenge in the past few decades, of course, is the climate issue. And then if we look at this figure, the uh, CO2 emission, of course, is increasing sharply in the past few years with the you know, contribution from a different country to different continent. So, but certainly, you know, we need more energy, but then in the meantime, we want to reduce the pollution. So that is the global challenge. It's not a regional problem. 
So then uh, a few you know, relevant uh, activities have been conducted, for example, and then if we can capture some CO2 and then do the CO2 sequestration, put, it, put them underground, hopefully we can reduce the CO2 emission. But then in, uh, on, the other, on the other hand, if we can get some like a more clean energy, for example, from geothermal, and then basically we just uh, suck out the heat underground and then use the heat for us. Or uh, we want to use the natural gas, which is uh, a cleaner fuel and then do not produce that much of a CO2 comparing to the, you know, the, uh, the current uh, major energy resources. So basically these are the demanding evidence and then uh, we observe the earthquakes. And then uh, here I want to just show you a bit more background in terms of unconventional resources because we need cleaner resources. For example, like uh, shale gas. Shale refers to uh, one type of rock, you know, such kind of this uh, really the dark color and then with the rich organs. And then that is really rich in terms of, uh, uh, you know, getting the reservoir or oil and gas. But then a little bit more background, although they sometimes are named the reservoir, but then all oil and gas were stored in underground rocks. You know, there's no like ocean like the reservoir. And then we basically need to, you know, get the uh, oil and gas out of the rock. So the conventional type of reservoir then usually refers to the large porosity and permeability. So if you just happens to drill onto the rock or the reservoir and then they will flow out naturally. But then of course these kind of reservoirs are, you know, uh, more like uh, uh, allocated to different uh, industries and then now are depleting as well. So, you know, industries then move on into those unconventional reservoirs. Actually, these are recognized at least a few decades ago, but then has not been extensively uh, developed because it is really hard to get them out. And because the rock is uh, so tight and among the different uh, minerals, and then the porosity and permeability are ultra, ultra low. But then, you know, people always can imagine different techniques and then to, in order to get those uh, energy from those unconventional reservoir, and then the horizontal drilling technique was invented. And then, uh, so basically this diagram is showing us, in the past, we normally drill down underground, the and then we, we, we are good at drilling vertical wells. But then in the past, you know, uh, more than 10 years or so, and then, we are able to drill horizontally. So this is really important because those reservoirs are sedimentary rocks and then normally they are distributed at the you know, layer-like formations. So then if you find them in a certain depth and then you drill horizontally, then you can suck them out. Of course, because the porosity and permeabilities are very small, then you need to artificially increase the porosity and permeability. So that's the technique so-called fracking so basically you inject the water or uh, make with a mixer with other chemicals and then uh, within the horizontal wells and then to break the rock, create artificially creating cracks so that the oil and gas may flow out. So basically that is the te technique. But then such activities are, um, I would say, inevitable because of the increasing energy demand. But then we observed, given the development of such kind of a technique, a lot of earthquakes are induced. And some earthquakes are larger than magnitude five and then cause some damages. And then later we'll show you a more example. And then, so of course, the seismic hazard is an important scientific problem, but also has a you know, very high societal uh, impact. And uh, in addition, uh, how the injected fluids may migrate underground. That is a uh, you know, difficult question. It is very hard to monitor. We are talking about something you know, below, a few kilometers below the surface, but this tunnel you know, has only a scale of 10 centimeters also. So basically we are talking about such uh, you know, drastic contrast in terms of uh, what we can monitor. So um, I want to show you the more specific example for us uh, to have the interest is that the shale gas development recently in the Sichuan Basin 
And then all the blue colors shown in this figure shows the, you know, the preferred reservoir. So basically there are a lot of resources, but in order to get them out, then you need to have, have to conduct those fracking activities. You know, that's time, give, give you a time uh, mark. The first vertical well was drilled in 2009 and the horizontal wells start to boom around 2013 also, and then gave the production. And then let's see how we you know, have achieved. In terms of shale gas production in China, because most of the contribution is from the Sichuan Basin. So basically this figure is showing us the shale gas production in the Sichuan Basin. So you can see since uh, 2013, you know, this number increased drastically. And then the unit here is billions of uh, cubic meters. All right, but then let's look at the earthquake numbers. So here I just uh, zoom in a very small region and then it called the Weiyuan uh, shale gas field. And then here I'm showing you the plot of the earthquakes over the past few years. So basically before 2015, then you see, you know, very rare earthquakes. And this is well understood because within the stable tectonic or geological unit, Sichuan Basin, and then there were no, you know, or very rare earthquake in the past. But you see those numbers, and then since 2015 also, and those numbers start to increase sharply. And then this right curve is more uh, meaningful for us because they release, it tells us how big the earthquake became. So basically since 2018 also, and then earthquake not only become more frequent, but now become larger and larger. And then I'm showing you another example over here, which is a magnitude 4.3 earthquake. And that occurred in 2019, February. Okay, and then uh, uh, actually this earthquake has a local magnitude 4.9, but then it was preceded by two power shocks one day before, and they caused a certain damages. Usually the earthquake below magnitude five would not cause damages. And these earthquakes are so damaging because they are very, very shallow. They are only for this earthquake, according to our results, and they are only like one kilometer below the surface, which is very rare. Most earthquakes occur 10 kilometers below or even greater depths. So we can see these earthquakes caused, you know, uh, at least uh, two people were killed and then a few injuries and then the total economic loss, uh, at least uh, 14 million RMB. And also right after this earthquake and then, you know, there's a large, you know, um, uh, the contest from the local residents and then they have to shut down the production immediately. So in terms of scientific, scientific question is how this earthquake occurred is, you know, an outstanding question. In terms of societal uh, impact, of course, this is very, very important. And then another, you know, a view is that because we do need energy, although the induced earthquakes are kind of, uh, you know, causing damages, but then uh, if you want to get the energy and then you need to maintain the safety in terms of uh, production. So uh, another challenging problem is that even though within those horizontal wells or in sometimes in even in those part, in the part of the vertical wells, and then the, uh, and nearly you need to drill a hole and then you do the casing. And then that casing perhaps may, may be cause the, uh, a significant deformation. So here is one example, you know, that is showing us the indicator of the deformation of the casing, the casing perhaps. So uh, to give you a scale, those deformation can be as large as 10 or 20 millimeters. But then the entire casing diameter is about 140 millimeters also. Okay, so that is very significant. And then to give a very early group of uh, data shows us actually at least 7% of the uh, design fracking segment over here have to be abandoned because of such a deformation problem. So, you know, from the industrial production point of view, this also becomes, you know, a significant problem, how to avoid such kind of a, you know, a distortion of the, of the casing. And then one major causes 
is those small earthquakes. The earthquakes are small enough, not causing you know surface damages or even uh, ground shaking. Two minutes that, left. Okay, thanks. That can be the ground shaking that can be felt by human, but then they can cause a significant displacement and leading to such you know a failure after uh, you know fracking well. So um, we now I just want to quickly show you you know what we can do. We have developed a fully coupled dual mechanical model, and then that has been proven effective in another uh, you know uh, area where we do the cyclic injection and extraction of the natural gas. And here it's just uh, showing us how reliable the model is. Uh, the blue is a measure of data, and then the red is the model prediction over a few years of uh, operation cycles. And here, this figure is just showing us how the model can explain why the earthquake occurred over there, because the red color shows the caused uh, pollen stress increasement. So this model is critical for us to answer a lot of questions related to uh, induced earthquakes. And another you know, uh, important factor for the ongoing effort includes, you know, we already collected some you know, samples. We have to understand the rock property in order to build that geomechanical model. And then in order to build that a reliable geomechanical model, then we have to conduct extensive uh, seismological investigations, including some field work. For example, earlier this year, and then my team has deployed uh, some seismic instruments really next to the operating platform like this. So we can really monitor the earthquakes in the field with uh, a very high resolution. So the objective, for the proposed uh, project, of course, given you know the fact that we need energy, so we have to live with the induced earthquakes. Then we need to care about the uh, seismic hazard. We also need to worry about the production safety, and then we want to also uh, and better understand the potential environmental impact of the you know the fluid injected in the ground. So why this is the, we, we, we think this is, should be a CRF instead of a GRF because of these objectives. Each objective is actually a huge actually. And then to answer, you know, uh, any of these objectives, we need to build a reliable geomechanical model. And then that Geomechanical model has to build on, you know, seismological investigation, geodetic monitoring, rock physics, and we have colleagues in Earth System Science targeting these targets. But then we also need expertise in statistics and also some, uh, you know, computational numerical modeling in terms of fluid flow in porous media because the underground fluid migration is a very difficult question to answer, and then we we'll have to solve it numerically. And hopefully we, we, we hope some colleagues within faculty of science may be interested and then we like to you know, uh, contribute and collaborate on those uh, products. So uh, I, I guess my time is probably up, but then I just want to point out the last question, even though to answer you know, whether earthquake is induced itself, it's very tough to answer because we have to understand all the potential mechanisms. And then so, definitely we look for different collaborators or potential contributions from different units. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Thank you, Professor Yang. Um, we've got some questions from the panelists and I will read it out one by one. Um, the first, first question is that is any possibility of earthquakes in Hong Kong in the future? The second question is that can induced earthquakes help to release stored energy near fault lines and help to do divert or avoid large earthquakes? And the last question is um, um, shall, ga shall gas production involve drilling or horizontal drilling, hydraulic fracking and the gas production? Which steps is more likely to cause seismic movement of earthquake. Professor Yang, please. Okay, well, the first question, uh, whether Hong Kong may be uh, prone to earthquakes. Um, earlier this year, January, there was an earthquake nearby, 
but it's pretty small magnitude 3.5 in the uh, in in the river mouth, and the, but then you know I I felt it. I live in COSK, but then I felt it, so it's felt it's earthquake. But this is the indicator that there are active faults surrounding Hong Kong, and then also the greater Bay Area. Actually, um, you know there is a larger fault a little bit offshore. But then to give you a scale, if there is a magnitude six earthquake. Okay, in terms of a magnitude, it's not very large, but then given the population and infrastructure, high rise buildings in Hong Kong, then the shaking will be very strong and then probably much stronger than what we will experience in, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, scale eight or 10 uh, typhoon. So I, I would say it is possible, but then it's, it's uh, you know, investigation are very limited. So um, we certainly hope to understand better. So the second question is uh, whether the induced earthquakes might help release the stored energy. And this is uh, actually a long lasting question in, in earthquake seismology. A short answer is that uh, it is uh, probably not possible to help release the energy because the induced earthquakes are relatively small, by far the magnitude is still around magnitude five also. But then in terms of, uh, you know, the energy released by a magnitude seven earthquake, for example, one magnitude seven earthquake released the energy equivalent to 1000 magnitude five earthquake. So you, you are getting, you know, um, one or two magnitude five do not really change anything for the potential to get, you know, uh, that larger one. And the uh, last question is more in details, whether these, uh, so which process may likely induce earthquakes, right? So, so the drilling, fracking, and so the drilling itself, uh, I, I don't see any report that the drilling itself may induce earthquakes. So, um, I, I think that is understandable because the drilling is basically limited and the scale is quite small, you know, just a few meters. And then uh, it is uh, the uh, impact is, you know, limited in terms of spatial coverage. But fracking certainly may induce earthquakes, as I show you. And then another important process is that no matter what kind of resources you are producing, most likely you are have to you, you have to recycle a lot of water. And then I've shown I'm trying to find you. Uh, okay, so basically you are sucking out the oil and gas here, but then there are a lot of water actually more than the much more than oil and gas. And then that waste of water you know, become a significant challenge for the environment. You cannot just put it on the surface because a lot of pollutants. Then, so what uh, usually industry will do is that to inject them back into some formations, but that process may cause even larger earthquakes has been proven in US. All right. Um, do I answer all these questions? Oh, uh, I... yeah, we, we still got some questions. Perhaps uh, you may choose one to ask. And okay. for the, yeah. I'll make it short. Um, so I see the question uh, is in one of the earlier studies, dams can, uh, water dam can also induce earthquakes. Yes, water dam can induce earthquakes and then the earthquakes are actually very large. Actually, the closest example is the Guangdong Heyuan there is a water reservoir, Xinfengjiang, which was built in 1960 in order to make the water supply downstream, including the major source of water supply in Hong Kong. But then in 1964, a magnitude 6.4 earthquake occurred. And uh, uh, why water dam can induce earthquake is that you know, this type of water is very large load, and then it may flow underground. So if there is a fault, you know, nearby, and then that water flowing into the fault may cause earthquakes. So that is quite common. In India, the largest uh, uh, 
reservoir water dam induced earthquake is close to magnitude seven. And if we make earthquake another as another unconventional source of energy, uh, well, that's a that is a good guess. Um, the, the problem is earthquake occur very fast, even for um, you know magnitude seven earthquake, and then it only last for twenty uh, seconds, also 20, 30 seconds, and then. And most of them occur a few kilometers below the ground, and then we just cannot utilize the energy directly from them. We feel the ground shaking, but then you need to, we have to worry about the efficiency in converting that kinetic energy into the energy we can use. But, you know, that is the challenge in terms of our conversion efficiency. All right, thank you, Professor Yang. Um, we will now have a 10 minutes Zoom break.